Have you ever been weighed down by a sin or struggle that just sticks with you? Have you ever done or said something that was so amazing that it kind of surprised you? When you're in trouble, do you ever find yourself turning more to tricks or techniques than to God himself? Hey everybody, this is Steve, and Christ can work wonders through us. In this week's Gospel, Jesus heals a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. And in this week's passage from the book of Acts, Peter heals a person and even raises someone from the dead in the name of Christ. Links, as always, are down in the doobly-doo. And remember to check out the intro videos we made for both John's Gospel account and the book of Acts to help you better understand the readings. The past two Sundays and the readings we heard during those liturgies were dedicated to Thomas and the Myrrh-bearers, to the way different groups of disciples responded to the truth of Christ's resurrection from the dead. For the next three Sundays, the Church shifts its emphasis a bit, and the readings focus more on us, all the new disciples that have joined the Church through the years. Back in episode 29, we mentioned that people tended to join the Church on Pascha, which is why the lectionary shifts to the Gospel according to John and the Acts of the Apostles. And of course, baptism is what brings us into the Church. So, in the readings for the next three Sundays, we'll see repeated references to water and baptism. Whether we join the Church as babies or as adults, we'll all have an opportunity to reflect on what our baptisms mean and how they've completely changed our lives. This week's Gospel reading focuses on a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. Like many other people who struggled with some kind of illness or disability, this man stayed close to the Pool of Bethesda, a pool of water that was by the Sheep Gate, which led to the Temple. The Sheep Gate, by the way, was an entrance that led to the Temple. It was used to bring in sheep, which were offered as sacrifice. Sick people stayed close to the pool because, every so often, an angel would come and stir up the waters. And the first person who entered the waters would be healed of whatever sickness or disability he had. So Jesus finds this paralyzed man who, for 38 years, has been trying and failing to be the first into the water. Because, of course, he was paralyzed and probably not that mobile, so someone always got to the water before he could. When Jesus encounters this man, he asks him a simple, and straightforward question. Do you want to be healed? We sometimes read this passage and wonder if maybe the paralyzed man was being a bit lazy? Maybe he could have tried harder to get to the water in time to be healed. I mean, really, why else would he be so unsuccessful for 38 years? But that's not what the sick man says when he finally meets Jesus. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is troubled. And while I am going, another steps down before me." Jesus didn't criticize the man for suffering for almost four decades. He didn't complain that the man could have tried harder or done better. Instead, he accepted this man's humble confession. He was alone and totally lacked the power to do anything to help himself. That's why Jesus didn't ask the man whether he could be healed. He asked whether the man wanted to be healed. The man couldn't do anything to save himself, but at least he could desire salvation. So Jesus asked him to be honest with himself and confess whether he actually wanted this healing. And then he pushed the man even further, telling him to rise, take up his bed, and walk. The man could have expressed disbelief. He could have gotten angry at Jesus for teasing him, for making fun of his condition. As we can see in verses 11 and 13, the man didn't even know who Jesus was. As far as he could tell, some stranger approached him and told him to get up. If some random guy came to you and told you that after 38 years you were finally healed, would you believe it? Yet this man, despite those 38 years of failure, never lost faith in God or the possibility that he could be healed. And when he encountered God face to face, even if he didn't quite know it at the time, he took the Lord at his word and did as he was told. He got up, picked up his bed, and walked. He spent 38 years waiting for water to heal him, 
and was surprised when the Son of God, he who is living water, healed him. The sick man spent decades hoping that some magical property of the pool's water would heal him, and was amazed when the Son of God revealed himself to be the man's only real hope. Because it is Christ himself who stirs the waters in the pool of Bethesda and heals people through them, just as it is Christ himself who blesses the waters of baptism and heals us through them. When the paralyzed man encountered Christ, he was alone, he was powerless, he was broken, both physically and spiritually. Yet, in that brief encounter with the Lord, everything changes. The man finds the very God who made him from nothing, who loves him and created him for an eternity of life and peace and joy. His body, which couldn't walk for 38 agonizing years, was restored. His soul, dragged down by sin, was renewed. That's why, when Jesus finds the man after the healing, he tells him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse befall you. It's not that sin caused the man to be paralyzed. Rather, Christ is warning the man about the consequences of sin. That, as bad as it was to have a wounded body, it's even worse to have a wounded soul, a character darkened by sin and death. Christ is inviting the man to continue walking, both literally and figuratively, in his holy name, in righteousness, in virtue, in holiness. And in this week's reading from the book of Acts, we encounter people who do just that. We see St. Peter work two incredible miracles. First, he heals a paralyzed man, and then he even raises a woman from the dead. Yet Peter would never say that he worked these miracles. He would say, as he does in the text, that these wonders are the work of Christ. Peter first encounters a man named Aeneas, who had been paralyzed for eight years. And the apostle wastes no time. He gets straight to the point. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. The text is clear. Peter says this, and immediately the man gets up. He rises from his bed and walks for the first time in eight years. But this doesn't simply transform the life of the man. It affects all those who lived in the area because they saw this sign, this wonder, and they turned to Christ. Later, Peter was in a different town, a place called Joppa. A Christian woman named Tabitha lived there. We read that she was full of good works and acts of charity, a good person who was beloved in the community. And when she suddenly becomes sick and dies, some of the Christians go straight to Peter to ask for his help. Peter goes to her body and, again, gets right to the point. He says nothing but two simple words. Tabitha, rise. And of course, Tabitha comes back from the dead. Notice that Peter doesn't say out loud that he healed her in the name of Christ, or rather that it was the Lord who was really responsible for the healing. But he didn't need to. Unlike Aeneas from the first miracle, Tabitha was a Christian, as were the people who witnessed her be raised from the dead. And just like when Peter healed Aeneas, the consequences of the miracle pointed to Christ. Because when people heard about what Peter had done, word spread throughout Joppa. And many believed, not in Peter, but in the Lord. Peter was not a magician. He didn't have powers that allowed him to do amazing things for people. He was a disciple of Christ. And whenever he healed people or worked wonders, he did it in the name of the Lord. He was an agent of Christ, someone who did the Lord's work, someone through whom the Lord acted. And by opening up his life in this way, by turning his life over to the Lord, Peter became who he was meant to be, a healer, a preacher, an apostle, a saint. Just like the water in the pool of Bethesda didn't heal people on its own, it was Christ who acted through the water, so the water could be what it was meant to be. And the paralyzed man discovered it when he was healed without water, by the one who sanctifies the water. This miracle has long been seen as particularly important in the church, which is why we read about it on the third Sunday after Pascha. And it's why, since very early, the healing of the paralyzed man was seen as an image of what happens to us in baptism. In Dura Europus, a city in Syria, 
archaeologists found one of the earliest known Christian churches, a regular house that was converted to a place of worship sometime in the 3rd century. Quick tangent, Jura Europus not only has this incredibly old Christian church, it also has an ancient synagogue that's particularly eye-opening. You see, when archaeologists found the synagogue, which was completed in the 3rd century, they were surprised to see that it was full of icons. Of course, that shouldn't surprise us, because if you remember our Be the Bee episode on icons, we can find examples of iconography even in the Old Testament. And of course, we know that Christian iconography goes all the way back to St. Luke the Evangelist. But anyway, back to the Dura Europa Church. One of the rooms in the building is a baptistry, where new Christians were baptized and welcomed into the church. And the icons in that baptistry are some of the oldest in the world. One of these icons is, of course, Christ healing the paralyzed man. So, as catechumens took their last steps to the baptismal font, as they prepared themselves for new life as Christians, they'd be able to look upon this icon of Christ healing the paralyzed man. They could reflect on all the ways they, just like the paralyzed man, were helpless on their own. All the ways they needed healing, both physical and spiritual. And they could look down on the waters of baptism and remember that those waters only have power in their connection to Christ, who is the source of our healing. Because the entire Christian life is ultimately about the Lord, and we live it in His name. No matter how long we may have been Christians, it's good to be reminded of that. We've covered a lot of ground today, and to help work through what this all means for each of us, we'll end, as we always do on Live the Word, with three questions. First, what struggle or difficulty have you been carrying around for what seems like forever? Remember, the paralyzed man had been there for 38 years. That's a really long time. What struggle in your life just seems to have a hold on you? Does any difficulty seem like, try as you might, it's just not going away? And how do you respond? Do you keep hoping that you'll be able to get into the water and find some healing? Or are you starting to reach the point of despair? Second, what things are you tempted to put your trust in instead of Christ? Just as it would have been easy to assume that the water held magical healing properties that weren't linked to Christ, we can put our hope in things rather than the Lord. Maybe it's modern medicine, maybe it's psychotherapy or self-help books. What are the things you trust as ends in themselves? Is it possible that Christ himself is the one who works healing through these things? And how would that change your approach? To these things. Third, what are the good works that you might be tempted to take credit for? St. Peter knew he wasn't the one performing good works, that it was really Christ acting through him. What would it look like for us? How would your life be different if you were really aware that we are, as Mother Teresa said, simply little pencils in the hand of a writing God? We'll be back with a new episode on Monday, and my buddy Christian will have a short response video up on Thursday as he wrestles with these questions. I hope you'll read the gospel and epistle passages we cover today. And whether it's with family or friends or a Bible study group, I hope you'll talk about what we've covered and wrestle with what God has for you in your life. Most importantly, I hope you'll celebrate with us this Sunday and every Sunday to hear the beautiful scripture readings proclaimed during the Divine Liturgy and to learn how you can live the Word. Thanks for watching. You can click on our logo to subscribe to our channel and make sure you turn on notifications so you never miss a video. On your right, you'll find a video that YouTube recommends for you. And on your left, you'll find a video we made about standing in Christ. And you can find lots more from us, including ways to donate at our website, y2am.org. Christ is risen.